All right, well, we are going to continue our series in uh, Growth 2020, right? How do we grow this year? And I know it may sound redundant, but we don't want to forget to grow this year, right? And so last week, we looked at Peter because I kind of beat up on him about, I don't know, two, three weeks ago. And so we, uh, we talked a little bit about him and about what uh, the good things that came from Peter's life. And this morning, we're going to talk about Judas. We're going to talk about Judas and his problems and how we can grow from someone else who really messed up bad. I mean, let's face it. Uh, Peter blew it, but nobody blew it as bad as Judas. But we can learn from his example. Now, the Lord had many hard words to say for those who rejected him. He had many hard words to say for those that did not even revere him. For example, if you look at Matthew 18, verse 6, Jesus said, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Whew, that's pretty harsh. Jesus was concerned about the little ones. In Matthew 23... Verse 27, he had some hard words for the scribes and the Pharisees. And littered throughout all this chapter, he calls them hypocrites. In verse 27, he says, For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, that's a tomb, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Pretty hard words. The scribes and the Pharisees were the religious rulers of that time. You religious rulers, you look good on the outside, but inside you're wretched. In Matthew chapter 7, Matthew 7, beginning in verse 21, was a continuation of a rebuke for false prophets. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have not we prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. There will be many people that come to the Lord. And say all of those things, and yet in verse 23 he says, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Can you imagine coming to the Lord after having essentially done many wonderful works in his name, and he says to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I, I got to say that I think the strongest words were spoken about Judas. Very, very, very heavy words. In Mark 14, verse 21, and can I say this? I've had a lot of people say bad things to me, about me, etc., etc. We've all had that. I'm not any anomaly here. You all have, have received the same condemnation by friends and family and, and enemies and all sorts of things. So... I've had a lot of people say a lot of things, but I've never had someone say this. In Mark 14, verse 21, the Son of Man indeed goeth, as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had never been born. That is very, very heavy. I've never had anybody say that about me. And maybe they've thought of it. Now, I know the Lord wouldn't say that about me. But can you imagine 
stooping that low, Judas stooping that low and having that many problems, that the Lord would say this, good were it for that man if he had never been born. Let's look at two things real quickly, two areas, two problems, essentially, that, uh, that Judas had. First of all, let's look at Judas and his bitterness. Judas and his bitterness. Judas was Jesus' treasurer during his earthly ministry. He was the one who collected, counted, and then circulated all of the the money that came into the ministry. He was, uh, I guess, even on a minor scale, the, uh, the CFO. He was the chief financial officer. He's the guy who we look to for controlling the money, the CFO. We have the CEO, the owner CEO. I mean, you can ascribe Jesus to that category, right? There would be the CIO, which is the chief information officer, the COO, which is the, the chief operations officer, and you've got just a variety of other, of other operating positions. But he was the financial guy. He was the guy that we looked to when it came to the money. He was the treasurer. Now, there's a lot of speculation to whether or not uh, Judas was saved. Some people would say that Judas, he wasn't saved. Uh, Now, there is no, in the Bible anywhere, there's no profession of faith that Judas had. He, uh, from my understanding, he never trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. However, that doesn't mean that he didn't trust Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. You understand, just because you don't know if someone has made that decision doesn't mean that they didn't make the decision. There are some people that say, well, he was saved, and he could have been. There are a lot of people that could have been saved. Now, there's, the controversy is pretty simple, I would say. Uh, at the end... When uh, Judas was about to betray the Lord, Satan entered into him. And we say, see, greater is he that is in you and he that is in the world. You see, Christian can't be possessed by the devil. They can be oppressed by the devil, but they cannot be possessed. So because he was possessed by Satan, he must not have been a Christian. I don't know. I can't be dogmatic. But what I can tell you is that he was actively involved in the Lord's ministry. He partook of those benefits, and we remember all the way back in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, when he sends forth his disciples. Look at this with me. Matthew chapter 10, Matthew 10 and verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth. This is including Judas. This is not excluding him. This is including Judas. Judas. And he sent them forth, in verse 6, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In verse 7, and as ye go, this is what he said, as ye go, preach, saying this, watch this, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was the commission for the twelve. Go forth and preach and say this, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When you go forth and preach, disciples, make sure you let people know the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That doesn't mean it's, it's uh, immediate. It means it's imminent. It means it's at any moment. Who knows? I mean, it's, it could be here. It's at hand, right? Watch this. In verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely have received, freely give. Judas was part of this. Judas was commissioned to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out the devils. Verse 9, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purse. See, men had purses. I don't know why I said that. I'm trying to figure it out right now. I don't know. Verse 10, nor script for your journey. Neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves. For the workman is worthy of his meat. Don't worry about your provision because the workman is worthy of his meat. When you work, 
You'll get fed. You'll get taken care of. Now, these disciples had power that we could only dream of. I mean, this power right here is is amazing. And then when you get to, to Acts, the book of Acts, we see the day of Pentecost where they were literally empowered by the Holy Spirit. I mean, the power just continued to grow. I just love that. I mean, how, how do, we can't even realize how much power they had to do what it was that God had asked them to do, but they had the power. God would have never instructed them to do these things had he not given them the power. And, of course, this was done to, vi- to vindicate their calling, to vindicate that they were, in fact, the disciples whom God had chosen. You see, Judas had all the blessings that the other disciples had. Isn't that amazing? He saw all the miracles. He partook of all of the blessings and all of the miracles that the other disciples did. I mean, imagine if you were there in this time and that power was given to you. To see the the people come back to life and the lepers cleansed and the devils cast out. And you were a partaker of that, just as Judas was. Had all the blessings. But he had something that the others did not have. He had bitterness. He had bitterness. This was what I believe one of his biggest problems Judas was a bitter man. On more than one occasion, Judas was not happy with the way money was being spent. You got to remember, he was the one who was in control of the money. And as he saw it be spent, he was concerned. He wasn't concerned for the reasons that we might be concerned, but he was the guy with the bag. In Matthew chapter 26, turn there if you would, Matthew 26. And I'll begin reading in verse 7. Matthew 26, verse 7. There came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head, talking about Jesus, as he sat at meat. But when his disciples, Judas here as well, when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. I have seen uh, some numbers that would suggest that this very precious ointment was worth about $50,000. It could have been worth as much as $120,000. That's a lot of money. Even if you take into account inflation, I don't care, that's a lot of money, just period, right? Right? There was another report back in John chapter 12. In John 12, let's look there in verse 2. In John chapter 12, verse 2, it says, There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, these are his words, verse 5, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Why wasn't this sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? I've seen some... Some numbers that say that this is anywhere between $3 and $123. Why was this not sold and the money used 
more appropriately. Now, these are the words of Jesus. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. These are, these are God's words. God inspired this. God knew this. God knew what was going on. Personally, I think Judas was obsessed with money. He didn't really actually care about the poor. He cared about the money. I think he became bitter because of how the money was spent, how the money was used. I think he was a bitter man. I think he was a bitter man, and he let that bitterness get to him. You know, friends, bitterness seeps into our lives. It seeps into our lives without us even really knowing it. And even the most bitter person will say, Oh, but I'm really not all that bitter. Or I don't have a bitterness problem. Bitterness taints everything we interpret. Bitterness becomes the, the, the way in which we read people. Bitterness is the means by which we interpret the way things happen to us. Bitterness seeps in in Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 14, Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men. I love that. And there's enough to chew on just with that one simple portion of a verse. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. It's amazing how bitterness takes control. Bitterness will control you. And people do all sorts of sinful things because they're bitter. They become very retaliatory. And we'll see that in just a minute. And bitterness is just one of the things that destroyed Judas. And bitterness will destroy you. I don't know how many of you in this room have had something happen to you where you just are are just stewing about it. And you stew about it. And you're just angry with the person. And you just become so uh, just absorbed with this idea that I am mad at this person. Bitterness will ruin you. And can I say this? Bitterness ruined Judas. Bitterness is a terrible thing. I think one of the things that keeps us growing spiritually is bitterness. I think it holds us back. I think it holds us down. I think it suppresses our growth when we become bitter. We begin to think about all of the all of the things. I'm just so bitter, angry with this person. Beware of bitterness in your life. But Judas had another problem. Judas had a betrayal problem. I, I think that this is the reason why it was better if he had never been born. Look at Matthew chapter 26 again. Matthew 26. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, he went unto the chief priests, mark that, went unto them, and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 
pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. We see in verse 14 that bitterness drove Judas to seek revenge. I'm so angry with God. I'm so angry with the way that the money is being spent. How could a person who is actively involved in the Lord's miracles, how could somebody who, went, who, was, who was sent forth to literally heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out the devils, How could somebody actually seek revenge upon the Lord? He was so bitter. He was so bitter. This bitterness drove him to revenge. Often while the person that you're bitter toward will forget all about it. Lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble God. You. Your bitterness isn't troubling them. They forgot about it. You see, we go to bed with our thoughts at night and we think about how many people have have done us wrong. You know? How many people that we just wish we could give a piece of our mind to? If we could just get a few licks in, that's it. You see, the bitterness isn't destroying them. It's not troubling them. It's troubling you. And it's troubling me. This is the root of bitterness. Verse 15, the bitterness drove Judas to allow them to set the price. How low are you willing to go? I mean, he went to the chief priest and says, well, just just, just throw a number out there. Just give me a number, any number will do. Anything to betray. I am so mad, I will take anything. How does 30 pieces of silver sound to you, Judas? Oh, 30 pieces of silver sounds good to me. I might as well betray him for 30. I would do it for 29. 30 pieces of silver. Sin will take you farther than you want to go. Bitterness will take you farther than you want to go. You know what 30 pieces of silver looks like? Right here. That's 30 pieces of silver. In today's value, these coins are worth about $25. Not all that much. 20 bucks. I could sell those right now for $20 to a handful of people. There's probably several people in this room I could sell them to for $20. I know I could sell them to my boys for $20. $600. This is what the Lord was worth. He was worth 30 pieces of silver. You know, back in that day, that would have been about the same. I've seen some numbers that talked about the silver being about $20, about $20 a piece. You see, Judas knew going into it that he wasn't worth much. 30 simple pieces. This is what God is worth to Judas. Verse 16, the bitterness then drove Judas to find an opportunity. Isn't that interesting that you'll usually find what you're looking for? And so now he's, now he's, he's on a quest. I know that I got 30 pieces of silver waiting for me. I know that if, if I just turn over the Lord, I'll get $600. $600. I think Judas would have taken a whole lot less, but he needed an opportunity. In John chapter 13, look there with me if you would. 
John 13, beginning in verse 21, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Now we're talking about the apostles, the original 12. But if you've trusted Christ as your Savior and decided to follow the Lord, then you are a disciple. Put yourself here in this place right now. One of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one to another, doubting of whom he spake. Imagine the disciples in that very room looking around. I wonder who he's talking about. Is he talking about you? He's talking about me? I don't know. I don't know who he's talking about. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, said, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Who is it, Lord, that will betray you? And Jesus, in verse 26, answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop. When I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Judas, I know what you're going to do. Why don't you just do it? And do it quickly. You see, Jesus knew what he was going to do, and he knows what we are going to do. You know, the, the, the omniscience of God, the all-knowingness of God is, is, is very comforting, but it is also very concerning that he knows your heart better than you do. He knows exactly how we'll act, how we'll behave, what we'll think. In John 2, uh, verse 24 and 25, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. That's concerning, isn't it? He knows your heart better than you do. You see, Judas had a bitterness problem which led to his betrayal. You see, Judas wasn't thinking about the master... You see, Judas was thinking about the money. Judas wasn't thinking about his Savior. He was thinking about the silver. You see, Judas's heart was, was not there. It was here. This is what, what led him to his decision. He betrayed the Lord because he was more concerned about the money. He was bitter because of how the money was being spent. Now, it's interesting because we say to ourselves, well, we could never do that. We, we, could, never, we could never deny the Lord like Peter did. We could never forsake the Lord like some did, and we certainly would never, ever sell the Lord. But I can tell you this, friends, that we sell the Lord off for a whole lot less than $600. We sell the Lord off for, for a, a television show or a sports game or, a, or we sell the Lord for uh, maybe something we, we, we see on, uh, on, on, on TV, some nasty thing or, or some music we listen to. We sell the Lord for a whole lot less than this. And who could have ever thought that somebody could sell the Lord for, for $600. I mean, maybe, maybe $6 million or $6 billion or $6 trillion, but $600? Sin will take you farther than you want to go. I think he would have taken less. 
in my negotiating skills, I would have got them cheaper. I would have said, no, 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 no. I would have set something up with the other chief priests and said, you start high, I'll start low, and we'll meet them down at the bottom. Judas came, and he said, how much? What would you give me? I said, I'll give you an attaboy just to see if I could, just see if I could win Judas over. Judas' heart was in the wrong place, wasn't it? Judas' heart was so far from being where it ought to be. Now, how can we grow this year using what we know about Judas? How can we grow? Well, number one, I think we can stay away from bitterness. Stay away from bitterness. Because bitterness kept Judas from being successful for the Lord. And bitterness will keep you from being successful for God as well. But not just, not just for God. Bitterness will keep you from being successful in your family. Uh, it'll keep you from being successful with your friends. If you're bitter towards your friends, don't ever expect success. A bitterness will keep you from being successful at your jobs. You think you want, you want a promotion? You want a raise? You want more money? You want more responsibility? Uh, just, just be bitter, and it will never happen. A bitterness is really what kept Judas from being successful. And if we are careful of being bitter, uh, we'll stay away from betrayal. So one is stay away from bitterness. Two is stay away from betrayal. I think betrayal is what kept Judas from feeling successful. I think he realized his wrong. Judas knew what he, had, what he had done. Nobody hung Judas. Judas hung himself. Nobody killed Judas but himself. He did exactly what his bitterness led him to do. In Matthew chapter 27... Matthew 27, beginning in verse 2, And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. This is Jesus, of course. In verse 3, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. So he takes this money back. Now, I'm not going to throw this like, uh, like Judas did, because then you guys would all collect it. I'd never get it back. But he takes the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? What do we care? Why do we care if you've done something wrong? Verse 5, and he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. This was the fate of his bitterness. His bitterness led him to betraying God. Now, we have to be careful of that as we try to grow this year. Many of you have had people who have been bitter against you, and it really hasn't troubled you. It's troubled them. But I can assume that pretty much everyone in this room at some point in time has been bitter against somebody for something. Maybe they've said something to you, and you have been offended at it, and now you're angry with them. Or maybe they've, somebody you know has done something to you, and you say, well, I didn't deserve that. 
Which, can I just say this this morning, that that's pride. That's pride. We say, well, nobody deserves that. Oh, think again. We all deserve a whole lot worse than what we get. And you and I both know it. So when we start to say we didn't deserve that, we have to ask our question, why? Ask us this question, why? Because I am better than that. Oh, so it is a pride issue. We've had things happen to us, and then you, you put up your guard. And you, you duck your head a little bit. And you're ready to just jab back, aren't you? You try to seek revenge, retaliation. Bitterness will take you farther than you want to go. In the wrong direction. And if we want to go in the right direction, if we want to grow this year, if we want to have a successful life, and if we want to feel successful, we can't have this burden of bitterness. We can't have the burden of bitterness in our life. We have to be forgiving to people. I've said this several weeks ago. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Let's face it, Jesus knew more than Judas. He could have given him the benefit of the doubt and said, you know what, Lord? You said not to take gold or silver, right? This, this little bit of money, that this $3 or whatever that, that, that this lady this spike nard or whatever it was, this, it's, 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 you, you'll take care of it, Lord. Give him the benefit of the doubt that he knows what he's doing. In this society we live in, in a COVID society, we, we, we ask ourselves, like, you know, this is just a mess, right? Give God the benefit of the doubt. Don't be bitter toward God, and certainly don't be bitter towards your brother. I tell you, if we could live a life without bitterness, if we could live a life that was, that was uh, free from bitterness, we'd live a life uh, free from revenge and anger and hatred toward other people. I just want to get back at people. <laughs> you know? And you see a conspiring, you know, Judas sitting over there by himself. Oh, I can't wait. That's not liberating. That's not growing. That's dying. I tell you what, if we want to grow this year, we have to start by knowing whom we trust. And if we trust Jesus as our Savior, we can certainly trust him to take care of the, the petty little money that we think maybe, maybe, maybe we don't know, God, maybe this is, we just don't know. God, take care of it. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Give him the benefit of the doubt. Trust him to save your soul. We sing these wonderful songs on Sunday, don't we? And, and I just, I love reading the words. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. Are you persuaded that he's able to save your soul? What a wonderful, wonderful song. We're not going to sing that. We'll sing another song. Friends, if you're here today, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Will you trust in him today? Will you believe he died on the cross for your sin? Don't put your faith in your works. Don't put your faith in your church attendance. Don't put your faith in your baptism. The Bible says not by works of righteousness, which we have done. It's not something you do. You can come to church and you can throw a bunch of coins in the offering plate. And it won't buy you anything in heaven. It won't buy you anything in heaven. Oftentimes, money is a big burden. Can I tell you that? Oftentimes, not having any money is better than having some. They worked their whole life to earn it. Then, they, work, then they, they take the rest of their life, I guess, or work half their life earning it. Then they spend the next half trying to protect it. Sometimes it's better not to have any money. Said by the guy who has no money. <laughs> Oftentimes poor people say that. <laughs> you know what I tell you? I'm just so glad that Jesus died for me. 
and that I can't buy my way into heaven. I want this coin right here to represent all of our sin. I want this hand right here to represent you and I. The Bible says we have sin, all of us. This sin right here is what keeps us from heaven. It's this sin. To go to heaven, you have to get rid of this sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. It's not putting money in the offering plate. It's not walking an aisle or praying a prayer. It's when somebody dies because the wages of sin is death. 2,000 years ago, Jesus made the payment for sin by dying on the cross. Here's our sin. Jesus comes and he takes our sin and pays for it. Just like that. Not because of something we've done, but because of something he's done for us. Friends, when I think about what Jesus has done for us, we can't live up to that. I'm so grateful that he paid my sin debt. And if he hasn't paid yours today, I pray that you place your faith in him because you know what? He has. He paid for our sin debt 2,000 years ago. So in essence, he has paid your sin debt. Would you trust in Jesus Christ today as your Savior? Would you work on not being a bitter person? I don't think we have a bitter church. Matter of fact, I, I, I just I don't have that feeling at all that we have a bitter church. But if you have bitterness in your life, I pray that you just forgive the people who have done you wrong. You give people the benefit of the doubt. You all see that? Going to have a sprinkling up here pretty soon. Place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior.